Um, Alan invited me to talk about the um, orogenic system um, mentioned just previously, uh, which is a huge pleasure then, since this is a topic that has been nagging me for decades, not, um, nearly decades now. And this is going to be the, uh, the uh, system that I will be spending um, on for the next hour or so. Um, anyway, while talking, I may be covering issues that you're not familiar with, uh, familiar with. so interrupt me at once and uh, ask your questions. I don't really want to uh, end up uh, and you have only understood about half of what um, I've been saying. Incidentally, I don't understand much more than half of what I will be talking about anyway. So <clears throat> what's so particular about the Andes? Um, this is just a, um, a zoom out, but um, it shows you, if you compare it to this map, that um, only about 5% of the globe's um, convergent plate margins host these extremely wide plateau-style orogenic belts. So out of about 40,000 kilometers of convergent plate margin uh, interface, we only have 5%, uh, that's um, 1,000 or 2,000 kilometers. That's it. Um, we don't really know too much about how many origins in the past have shown a similar kind of style. Presumably, the North American Cordillera is a good candidate. Uh, there may be more, but we don't know too much about that. And you also note on this view graph already that the Andes along strike are extremely diverse. We have a roughly 7,000 kilometers origin, and it varies substantially along strike. However, this is approximately the part of the system that I will be talking about in the uh, uh, next uh, hour, from about this latitude down here to maybe up here, but the focus will be on the center. Okay, so um, Alan asked me yesterday to provide a little uh, virtual field trip uh, for the outset. This is what I'll start with, and this will be from the west to the east. So this is the western margin, the western boundary of the Andean Cordillera, and you see this extremely steep flank where it goes up from about 2,500 to uh, roughly 5,000 up there. And this is topped by the volcanoes uh, from the active uh, uh, volcanic system that is um, residing on the western margin of uh, this plateau. If you uh, climb up uh, to the plateau rim, in between the volcanoes, many of uh, which are active, but many of which are extinct as well, you have these internally drained basins that are forming salars and uh, preventing eroded material to be exported from the Andes. Uh, if we move all the way to the east... Back to the last one. Yeah. You said that they were forming something. Salars? Salars, yeah. That, those are salt pans from internally drained basins where anything that is getting eroded gets flushed into. The water evaporates and what's, uh, uh, what's left is um, um, uh, salt. That's the white there. That's the white stuff, yeah. Uh, during the rain season, you are safer off if you don't walk on them. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's much like uh, Salt Lake. Yeah. Okay, so this is standing on the eastern rim of the plateau, looking west, and th this was a particularly brilliant uh, day, so uh, this is approximately 200 kilometers uh, off. And the plateau, as you can see, it, it's not as flat as Kansas, but nearly so. And uh, you only have these little hills in between, and you, from, the, from, the, from the breaks you can see that uh, bedding is often inclined, so there is deformation there with uh, coverage uh, by younger deposits. This is the volcanic chain on the western edge of the plateau, as I said, 200 kilometers off. This is from an elevation of close to 5,000 meters, and the plateau is approximately four kilometers high on average. So if I now turn around uh, and look towards the Amazon basin, it looks entirely different. You have these huge uh, thunderheads here that are uh, uh, um, telling you that this system is being eroded heavily, as you are seeing here in the landscape. So this is a real origin. All the rest that, you show, uh, that you've seen before is, is just hillside country, although it's extremely high. Uh, it's only the western flank, uh, the eastern flank, sorry, that has this extremely deeply incised uh, valley. In fact, this valley from top to bottom is about four kilometers. You can drop the entire Alps, European Alps, in them and you won't find them again. So this is what the, the Andes uh, really looks like um, in a nutshell, and uh, I'll be uh, covering some of the more fundamental issues. Now, those of you that are 
familiar a bit with the history of uh, geodynamics from um, Barbara was mentioning the important issue uh, of uh, us uh, having a fantastic theory at hand but not understanding all of the workings of the Earth system. In fact, uh, we have a nice theory of uh, orogeny in the plate tectonic framework since about four decades when Dewey and Bird published the seminal paper. Um, providing the first uh, modern explanation of ocean continent uh, converging systems forming origins. Um, so, so this is what they conceived it to be. I don't want to go through the details. I just want you to be aware that these kind of ideas are around since a few decades and that they in a way provided the first conceptual framework for orogeny to occur at convergent plate margins. And this important framework also provided a series of physical explanations why certain features are coupled or appearing jointly. Like subduction occurring here, the formation of a high cordillera, which in those days was considered to be strongly governed by extensional processes, um, with some magmatic involvement, uh, however. And as you also see, much of the story is happening behind the arc. This is the arc and this is the back arc, and you see a lot of action here in the back arc. This is uh, what I will be coming back to uh, during my talk. So this in a way set the stage for the kind of debate that we are having uh, currently. Um, when you study orogeny, you can take a whole range of different um, perspectives. And um, while this list here is not comprehensive, I am just uh, uh, letting you have a look at a few of these, like uh, studying the PTT paths of metamorphic rocks and their fabrics or um, their uh, internal structure that will uh, yield some information on the kinematic evolution. You could also take a more large-scale perspective uh, doing geophysical imaging or section balancing. This is a nice other kind of strategy. It will provide you with snapshots of the present-day structure, but with very little information about the temporal evolution before that. Or you could do tectonic geomorphology, as uh, uh, Alan has just mentioned a minute ago, one of the very popular topics um, at present. This is a wonderful strategy. Uh, this, uh, by the way, is the uh, eastern flank of the Andes. Uh, um, a wonderful strategy really to understand how surface evolves and how material gets moved around at the surface. But it only looks back a few hundred thousand years in the past. So it's not really a tool that will help you to understand the origin. Or you could even take a more theoretical stance looking at the forces and mechanics that are involved. In fact, I'm listing this page because I'm going to do none of these in, in the forthcoming lecture. I want to take a more simplistic um, approach, um, uh, but one that in a way hinges on the kind of data that are being generated by these various approaches. And the simplistic approach, or what I for myself from my perception view as a, the more simplistic approach is the number one feature that is associated to orogeny, and that is masses being moved around. Masses being moved around. Um, now, as a first conceptual background for that, you, uh, I, I have to confront you with this uh, um, simple system here. It's really a very simple system. I'm not going to go into the details of how these equations shown here on the left side are being derived. Basically, they are being derived from solving the force balance equation that I was showing you uh, before. But the interesting and very fundamental insight that is contained in this view graph is that any kind of mountain belt behaves like a sandwich. So you can do this kind of experiment yourself next time you're on the beach and uh, I don't know if there's a beach trip planned for the next uh, uh, a few days. The simple experiment is take a piece of cardboard or wood, uh, plug it in the sand and push the sand and what will happen is you're going to produce a wedge of sand that will be growing on one side of the cardboard as you're pushing it. And what you'll also note is that the geometry of this sand wedge will be remaining absolutely constant over time. Its surface taper or its surface slope will be a stable feature, as will presumably, if you push it horizontally, be the basal detachment angle that is shown here, this angle here. So, <clears throat> in fact, what your experiment will be doing is as you keep these um, um, components constant, it will establish force balance within the system and as a result the system will develop and evolve in a self-similar geometry. Geometry will remain constant. And This is not only done by sand, it's also done by origins. 
Um, this is a nice view graph here, a bit more theoretical. It links this surface slope to the basal detachment. You could also consider the equivalent to be the angle of subduction or the angle of any first order detachment system that is underlying your origin. And within this uh, alpha beta space, you have these three fields here. The white one here, the blue one here, and the white one on top. And you have a line separating these. Uh, this equation here, shown here, this very simplistic equation relating just the angles, a material constant here, the friction uh, coefficient of friction of the base here at the base, uh, predicts that any kind of stable solution will be falling on these lines. So anything outside these lines is not in a stable uh, position, really. So if you do your sand experiment on the beach, uh, uh, what you will be experiencing is that the system that is going to be pushed in front of your cardboard will be plotting somewhere along those lines here, some, somewhere along that line. Um, if, it's, uh, if you're sh pushing it horizontally, it should be exactly here. Very simple prediction from this wonderful equation. And um, what you will also note that it's not perfectly constant over time for the simple reason that there's new, new sand being added to the tip and possibly also the base of it. So we'll, it will be fluctuating a little bit, but just a little bit. Um, so this is the wonderful and very general prediction that I will be uh, using. And it has a um, range of um, kinematic and um, um, other implications for the way that masses are being moved into and through an origin. To give you an indication of what I'm talking about, this is one of the experiments that we'll go into more detail uh, on uh, at, uh, in the afternoon. And uh, you're seeing one of these experiments running, and the active faults are highlighted here in these colors. I'll tell you this afternoon what this is uh, really about. And what you'll note is that here, the surface slope is remaining very constant, very stable. Uh, it's not changing a whole lot. It's just fluctuating mildly. And you see that the system is evolving as material is introduced through the front and here also through the base of the system. And uh, what you see is that uh, material mm, moves in a way through the system that um, um, ends up in a very uh, a general pattern uh, illustrated here on, the, on this lower side uh, down here. These flow lines are the material tra tra trajectories uh, um, that um, particles follow as they move into and through the origin. This is a very typical uh, kind of pattern that emerges during this kind of uh, orogeny. Yeah. Is that a numerical simulation or a sandbox? Or? It's a sandbox simulation, yeah. But numerical simulations would provide the same kind yeah. of image. In fact, the view uh, graph here, this um, image down here, is from a numerical simulation by Sean Willett. And it uh, provides exactly the same kind of result, uh, which in this particular case is uh, solely governed by the fact that material is fluxed into the system from one side and you have a velocity discontinuity uh, uh, down here, which is a bit an artificial component in the system, but you can't do without it really in numerical experiments and in sandbox experiments as well. You could consider this uh, velocity discontinuity, which is here in the analog experiment, to be akin to the uh, point where your subducting system moves into the mantle, yeah. where material is being scraped, scraped off and added to the base of the growing origin. In fact, uh, you can see a lot of this material that has been uh, accreted here at this place. It's all this material making up the, the hanging wall of this back thrust, uh, uh, responsible for these flow lines that uh, move material all the way up from depth to the surface back to the surface again. Um, OK, uh, just for terminological reasons, we usually call these two wedge-like structures a pro-wedge and a retro-wedge. And uh, I'll be using this kind of terminology in the next few minutes. The pro-wedge is the part of the uh, orogenic structure that is facing the side from which material is fluxed into the origin. The retro-wedge is the one on the opposite side. Okay, and it's the pro wedge that uh, virtually digests all the incoming material, and the retro wedge is just uh, something like a passively reacting 
uh, part of uh, um, the upper plate um, that um, is deformed along with the pro wedge, but it's not really seeing a lot of material passing through it. So the separation between these two wedges is the uh, face plus force. So like, like, like in this figure, the face plus of four also cuts through the, the topography eye. Exactly. Not, not usually the case. Yeah, it, it can cut through the topography. It does not always do it. Uh, there are orogenic uh, um, examples uh, where this does not really happen, or with this retro wedge is not very well expressed. Um, in others, uh, the retro wedge may even take over and be the more important part. Um, and um, when we come to the Andes and export this kind of um, concept to the Andes, we'll note that there are a few interesting aspects that are uh, exactly opposite to what we expect. Um, Yes. So the, 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 the simplistic assumption is it's homogeneous. Um, there's no anisotropy in it. Um, but you can add all this kind of complexity. Um, in fact, if you add this kind of complexity, it does not affect and change the fundamental pattern that I've shown here. Uh, so anything that you add here in terms of the mechanical complexity and heterogeneity, um, you will still end up with the bulk of material being moved through, into and through the pro wedge, and the retro wedge only be a passively reacting system. Okay, <clears throat> now you can think up, do, you can do a thought experiment and think up all kinds of combinations of pro and retro wedge systems that could possibly exist on a single planet like ours. Um, these are all the options that you get. This here at the top is the one that I just showed you. So you have the material coming in from the right side here. It gets added to the pro wedge. And the pro wedge mm, moves, or from the force balance uh, aspect, uh, it forces the forming, gradually forming retro wedge to react to the redistribution of masses in the system. And you get this topographic asymmetry. That's the very simple case where you have a single velocity discontinuity. Now you can start experimenting with uh, the velocity discontinuity at depth. Uh, and you can see what happens. So for example, if you allow this system to have a very broad decoupled, mechanically decoupled base, what will happen is you generate a flat topped plateau at the surface. And you have one pro wedge here where material enters the system and the retro wedge, but separated by a broad plateau. You can already sense where I'm going to. This is, in fact, uh, the kind of setup that is fundamentally required if you want to build a plateau-style origin. You cannot operate such a system with a single velocity discontinuity at depth. You must have a sub-horizontal layer of very low mechanical coupling uh, at depth. Um, I don't want to be specific where, but it must be at depth. Otherwise, if you do not have this kinematic constraint, you will not be able to build a plateau. OK, <clears throat> so you can let these. Uh, now you see here two um, velocity discontinuities separated by this uh, zone of mechanical decoupling. You can let this, these do various things, like move it in space, like uh, uh, I've shown down here. You allow it to move in space. and. The only thing that happens is your plateau broadens. It widens over time. You could also have these uh, expand both ways. If you have no material being fluxed into the system, if you have material flux into, in this case, you will have material being fluxed into the system from both sides. You will have a double pro flank or pro wedge origin. So if you flux in material from both sides of the origin, you will have two flanks of the origin with low surface slopes. You could also do the opposite. This will happen if the two velocity discontinuities move closer together in space. Basically, you are narrowing this zone of very low mechanical coupling. In this case, you get a double retro flank style origin with very steep surface tapers. And there's no material addition to the origin. It doesn't grow. So then you get this double retroflank system. Um, 
So you get all these kinds of combinations, and incidentally, you'll be seeing more of that um, in the next few slides. We can show that these central Andes have evolved from this kind of situation into this kind of situation, where the origin is expanding laterally. It, it is growing laterally at a rate of currently a little more than a centimeter per year. OK, um, so this is the more generic aspect. Um, let's look at it uh, from a modeling study. But first, um, yeah. Just trying to imagine what's going on beneath the model. If you can give some idea of what produces those discontinuities. And I'm just trying to imagine below the crust what the flow of material is, what the discontinuities are. We are not constraining this. We are just um, um, requiring the system to be mechanically decoupled and not prescribing what's happening down there. And whatever the reason for decoupl decoupling is, we don't um, uh, consider that. We only introduce this kinematic uh, condition um, that there is no mechanical coupling here and that the two velocity discontinuities are separated and may eventually be moving over time. But you could sort of think of the one on the east side as being the craton. And the one exactly. On the, and the one on the west side being where the plate stops into the mass. Exactly. So this would be the expectation that this is where the plate is subducting into the mantle. Now, if you look at the real world, sorry, but you're wrong. <laughs> so, so this is the Andes. And remember the virtual field trip I gave you a few minutes ago. We have the extremely steep western flank facing the Pacific. So subduction is somewhere going down here. This would be the retro flank. We have the flat plateau. And then here, towards the Brazilian shield, we have the pro flank. So it's the other way around. Uh, if you take the European Alps, they're not only a lot smaller, but there the pro flank is sitting on the right side of the belt, facing the incoming European plate, and the retro flank is facing Italy, which is the upper plate. So with the Andes, we have a funny situation. It's exactly the opposite of what the standard textbook uh, would uh, let you expect. Uh, are we, and are we looking north or south? We are uh, looking north. Left is west. Right is east. Yeah? So towards the, left, towards the left, we have the Pacific. Towards the right is the Brazilian shield. And the Alps, it's, uh, it's northwest. And here on the right would be the east. Yeah. OK. You get it? It's, it's absolutely counterintuitive, but it's, it's of first order importance because it explains the fundamental asymmetry that we have in this origin. And the reason is, the fundamental reason is, there's no material pushed into the origin from the Pacific. There's no material coming in. All the material entering the origin is coming from the east, from the Brazilian shield. And this numerical run here show how, shows how the system evolves by material moving in from the right into the origin. This is where the red colors indicate high strain rates, high deformation rates. And they're moving outwards, moving outwards. And you see the plateau broadening with these bluish colors indicating that deformation velocities are very slow. Very little is happening. And here you can see the back thrust system. It's only active at very low deformation rates, generating, <laughs> generating a steep retro wedge. And you have here the broad and wide pro wedge, which is eating up all the material and uh, accommodating all the material that is being fluxed into the origin. So this is, again, the, this fundamental issue. If you want to understand origin, make sure you understand the mass flux geometry. So and We're not regarding that. We are just looking at the upper portion. In fact, I think we scale this to just look at the crustal um, level. Below that, you would have the mantle lithosphere component of the lithosphere package, which would be entering the system. So, just your decoupling, so do you have mass moving through your decoupling zone in this model? No, we don't allow that. Or so your decoupling zone, as the thing gets thicker, the decoupling zone just stays at the bottom of the model. Exactly, exactly. It's a very simple kinematic prescription that we force the model to do. But it's 
taper on both sides, critical taper, different angles. At different oh. angles, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so we have the steep taper, typical of the retro wedge, and the shallow taper, typical of pro wedges. And all the material coming in here, the high deformation rates predicted by this um, uh, numerical run to be associated to the pro wedge system. They're both in force balance. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so, so the number one message is the Andes are growing by addition of material from the east and not by material addition from the incoming Nazca plate uh, where uh, the plate is just subducting below the continent, but it's not adding material to the origin. Hence, it generates an asymmetry in the style shown here with a low taper and a high taper system here. And it's expanding, but mainly by growth towards the Brazilian shield. Uh, that's an interesting issue. If I come back to this uh, fundamental geograph here in the flat slab situation, I would expect the situation to be currently in this stage, but it may evolve to this stage. Uh, it may evolve to this stage. The flat slab situation has a fairly steep taper, a st a taper also on the eastern flank, and it's not really growing laterally very quickly. Um, it may be in a transient stage um, wanting to change towards this stage here. But uh, let's wait a few more millions. We'll know by then. Anyway, this is the, the number one aspect relating to masses uh, and uh, the volumes being pushed around uh, uh, with orogeny. The, second, um, the next important thing is to not just look uh, at uh, masses being moved around from the sides of the origin, but also from below. So this is the view graph that I showed you at the outset that shows this nice um, topographic uh, architecture with a broad, flat plateau here, roughly at an elevation of four kilometers, and these more narrow belts here in the north and in the south. Now, the middle image here, it shows the depth of the continental moho. And it shows that uh, it nicely mimics the topography so here where we have the dark colors, you can't read the numbers, but it says about 70 to 60 kilometers. So we have a 70 to 60 kilometers thick crust underlying the plateau, balancing isostatically um, the topography that we have here on the right side. And as you see, uh, the flanks of the origin in the south and way up in the north, they don't have much of a crustal root anymore and they don't have much of topography either. Now the interesting thing is when you add up um, the thickness of the uh, entire continental lithospheric package, because you see here on the, on the left uh, view graph that um, here the central portion of the Andes has a very thin lithosphere that is only 60 to 80 kilometers thick. So telling you that below the continental moho there is very little continental mantle lithosphere left. Very little. Here, out here, we have the thickness of the Brazilian shield mantle lithosphere, uh, uh, the Brazilian shield lithosphere, which is about 140 to 160 kilometers thick. 35 kilometers to 40 kilometers of that would be continental crust, and the rest is mantle lithosphere. And this is uh, evidence, and I guess that George will be going um, into that um, in more detail, that uh, significant portions of the mantle lithosphere must have been lost over time. So there's not just mass fluxed into the origin from the sides, there's also mass lost from below. Incidentally, the plateau is laterally limited by these portions where we have um, thicker mantle lithosphere almost to the um, intersection with the Nazca plate here on the Pacific side. It's only here where we get this high flat top plateau south where we also do not have a lot of mantle lithosphere, lithosphere we don't, we're not developing a plateau-style origin. OK, this is all the geophysics I'm going to show, because we're going to see a lot more in the next few days. But it's important. This one is particularly important for understanding the mass um, fluxes into the origin, or out of the origin in this particular case. Um, this is summarized a bit by this um, 3D view graph, uh, where we have uh, um, a system that has an, a very thick package of lithosphere coming in from the Brazilian side, but it's 
thinning dramatically here to just about 60 to 80 kilometers, while the continental crust, as you see here, is thickening dramatically. It's virtually doubling. And most of the deformation, as indicated here, is occurring on this low tapered eastern flank of the system, while the western retro wedge flank has this retro thrust system, uh, which is fairly steep and produces this uh, very steep flank that you also saw on the virtual field trip that I took you through. Okay, so this is the Andes in a nutshell, their current state. And the That's a very good question. In fact, um, there's debate at which level really decoupling takes place. There's indication from geophysical data that significant portions of the middle crust are molten and may form a first order mechanical discontinuity that might be responsible for this decoupling. Um, but also we, note from, uh, we know from geophysical imaging, from attenuation of uh, seismic waves, that the asthenosphere may be in an another uh, level at which you may be decoupling the system. So there may be more complexity than just thinking in terms of one single decoupling zone. Okay. Can I ask if um, on your schematic studies, um, in order to get that bottom plateau, how much uh, slip has occurred along? Good. Right. I'll give you the answer in the next few minutes. Oh. So the, second, um, the next uh, point is to look at the kinematics. I've just talked about the mass fluxes how, and the masses, how they are moved into the system and out of the system. And the next thing I'm going to do is look at the kinematics of the system. Now, this is a nice uh, compilation by Rick Almedinger that shows um, how material is currently deforming the system from GPS data, but also showing as these dots here paleomagnetic evidence for block rotations. And uh, what, emerges, what emerges is that there is a very simplistic, very fundamental pattern of um, rotation of the, of, the, of the two flanks of this uh, mountain belt as it is gradually being compressed. You can also see from the length of the vectors that shortening is highest here in this central bend and it decreases on both flanks. So as a consequence, material rotates along these yellow arrows and uh, um, uh, superposed on the uh, uh, complete rotation of the system uh, uh, of the, with these two flanks. In addition, what you can perhaps not see from the back, but you see that the length of these arrows decreases dramatically here towards the eastern margin of the system. This is a velocity gradient. A velocity gradient is equivalent to strain being accumulated in the rock. So we have the zone of high strain again here at the eastern margin of the belt. And the only reason why it looks uh, like the Andes are growing eastwards is because the reference system chosen by the geodesist in this image is placed with its reference point somewhere on the uh, Brazilian shield. But what, from what I've been telling you just now, it's not the Brazilian shield that is sitting there and waiting for the Andes to overrun it. It's the other way around. The Andes are sitting there and the Brazilian shield is shuffling material into the origin. It's just a matter of what uh, reference uh, point you are choosing. But the geodetic uh, um, view of the world is that uh, the materials are moving uh, across the Andes. Um, in fact, from, from looking at the um, motion of material with respect to the hotspot reference frame, you can show that the trench and the Andean mountain belt are residing more or less stably. And it's the South American plate, as Alan has just uh, been uh, talking about previously, that is being moved westwards because of opening of the South Atlantic. So it's like a, like a ship and then the waves kind of turning around? Yeah. The rotation? Yeah. Basically yeah. Yeah. In a way. In a way, that's what it is. Um, the next thing. Yeah? Go back that one. Is that the GPS measures uh, short term? Like, uh, yeah, just uh, one or two decades. Like uh, yeah. instantaneous, does that include all the streams? In, the it in, a, in particular, near um, the coastline, it includes all the elastic deformation from the seismic cycle. You'll have to remove that. 
but we think that beyond the volcanic arc there's not a whole lot of elastic uh, component in the signal because the elastic component is practically removed through the soft volcanic arc and most of the GPS uh, deformation pattern seen in the back arc area is more or less equivalent to the long-term geological displacement field. In fact, the Andes, Andes are one of the cases where the long-term geological displacement field is nearly identical to the present-day GPS displacement field. This is not the standard, I should say. Yes. I'll come to that. I'll come to that. They do change, but uh, 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 one note um, that uh, I will be coming uh, to in the next few minutes is you always see this flat-topped plateau, and you've seen it in the virtual field trip. The material eroded locally is not exported from the origin. It's dropped into these internally drained basins that have the salars. Mm. So nearly all the material that is eroded here is left in the system. It's only on the eastern flank where we have these deeply incised valleys that material is exported out of the origin. Everywhere else it stays there and the reason is because it's so arid. There's not a whole lot of erosion there. I'm curious if the central Andes are deforming because the crust is weaker there and it allows to form or because it's mm -hmm. more applied force? Good question. We're going into that? We are going into that. Yeah. So <clears throat> I just showed you on the last view graph the present day shortening from GPS velocity. And now this is the uh, long-term geological shortening. But as you see, the axes are not correct. So I'm turning it around. And what you see here is from uh, 30, deg 30 degrees south to about 15 degrees south, exactly equivalent to this image here. And this line here depicts the variation in total shortening. Uh, you can see here at the axis where the origin is widest, we have roughly 300 kilometers of shortening. And as we move north, it diminishes to, let's say, around 100 kilometers. As we move south, it diminishes to even less than 100 kilometers. So it's a nice bell-shaped distribution of shortening that you can relate uh, to this um, varying, systematically varying width of the plateau. We have a systematic, symmetric, shortening gradient, um, producing the central, making the central part of the system that uh, which has uh, accumulated most shortening. So the, the greater the shortening, the wider the zone. Exactly. Makes sense. Yeah. You have more material advected into the plateau and... What makes sense with that? Yeah. The opposite, you didn't do that. Yeah. If you just took a, two passive markers and shortened them more, they would be closer to each other. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hmm? Over time, about 50 million years. Yeah, we'll get to the time now. Um, but just uh, this view graph here on top, what you see here is again the Andean topography. This is the red vectors are the GPS shortening. And you see that the average GPS um, vectors, they're converging. And this is adding to this aspect of accumulating mass in the area of the bend. In fact, as a consequence of this accumulation of mass in the bend, the crust here should be approximately 20 kilometers thicker than we see it in the geophysical data. Also, it would uh, indicate that we have bluish domains here and north, where the crust should be about 30 kilometers thinner than we see in the geophysical data. So as a consequence, we have to require the lower crust to move about to compensate for that. So what we see in the geological record and in the GPS data is really only telling us something directly about the upper crustal deformation. It's not providing a direct image of what the lower crust is doing. So if we consider the geophysical image of the system that I've shown you previously to be correct, the lower crust has to be mobile. It has to flow laterally to compensate for these variations in masses um, that are uh, being moved about in the system. So that's an important thing to be aware of. The lower crust may be doing something entirely different. Yeah. Um, what's about the western margin in terms of the mass flux? Is there some, some crustal shortening or erosion actually potentially going on? Yeah, good point. I'll come to that. Here it is. Um, um, 
This is, uh, again, this bell-shaped distribution of shortening. And now I've now expanded that all the way to the north and to the south. And you can see here in the violet line, this is the distribution of shortening along the entire Andes. So it's only the center that has this nice symmetric bell-shaped distribution. The rest becomes more complex. And now the point that you've mentioned, uh, in fact, on the, southern, on the, on the um, western edge of South America, material is being removed by subduction erosion. And that's this blue line. Uh, so you can see that there's quite substantial amounts of material that are being removed from the system by subduction erosion, by scraping off of material from the tip and the base of the upper plate. And you will note that here in the north, for example, we have about 150 kilometers of continental lithosphere removed in 50 million years. So first order, three kilometers per million years. The global average is about 1.5 to 2 kilometers. So the Andes are particularly efficient in subduction erosion. They are removing material at a rate um, that is quite substantial. Um, this goes on for quite a range to about 33 degrees where the Juan Fernandez Ridge is currently impacting the system and then subduction erosion rates for the Cenozoic diminish. But here data are getting poorer and I think Suke is going to give us a, a little more information there. What we can see is that the important oceanic ridges like the Nazca Ridge and the Juan Fernandez Ridge, they have traveled along the path shown here by this arrow along the margin. So presumably their impact on the margin has been to assist subduction erosion quite dramatically. If we add both curves, we end up with this yellow line. And if we take the yellow line and add it here, this is what South America looked like 50 million years ago. It really looked like it uh, went through a diet in the past 50 million years. Exactly. By subducting, By subducting it into the mantle. Exactly. Yeah. So a quite substantial fraction of South America has been lost into the mantle. It's not added into the origin because we miss it in the balance. And the remaining has been shortened. So if you take all this material between the present day coastline and here, and compresses, uh, uh, remove the eroded material, there you have the Andes. That's the mass that is being used to build the Andes. Okay. Quick question. Do you know that the eroded material isn't just being shoved into the arc and that what you're losing might be South American lithosphere up from below the arc? I just wonder if you know what's being eroded is actually what goes down. Um, if we had the amount of material that was eroded introduced into the origin, we would have uh, a dramatic surplus of, or, you know, of crustal volume that would not be balanced by the shortening observed. Now, from the previous balance and the previous view graph here, we find that the total shortening observed in these diagrams here is entirely sufficient to explain the present day crustal thickness image geophysically. Um, because this balances, we believe that subduction erosion has removed crustal material all the way to the mantle because we don't find any relevant volumes within the crustal system today. And the geochemists tell us they don't see a whole lot of material well, added. Just wait. Just wait. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> we see some of it. Some of it, we'll yeah. I'll show you we see some of it. I was just wondering if you are shoving the margin under South America and then what's right under the origin, a different mass, yeah. Really yeah. Know that. Well, if I were holding the light down there, uh, we might. But uh, what what we what we note is that volumes balance with present with with known shortening, known tectonic shortening. So there's no need to to really um, have to invoke additional material introduced, uh, like subducting uh, eroded material added from the base or whatever. And all of the lithosphere. How much? We don't exactly know because we don't know the initial lithospheric thickness uh, when the origin was shortened, uh, started shortening. But we believe that um, initial lithospheric thickness must have been thin because we've had various stages of uh, Mesozoic rifting. Uh, 
affecting the margin. So eventually the lithosphere may have been thin from the outset, but not to the degree that we see it uh, now in the geophysical data. But it can't have been that thin because there's not magnetism in the back arm yeah. really much of that time. So if the yeah. is really thin, and yeah. you're going to get magnetism. So it must have been after, after well, we do the have these. Um, I think the, the, the people, there's this Cretaceous magnetism and, and uh, Jurassic magnetism that is related to these Mesozoic stages of rifting in the back arc that must have thinned the lithosphere. Yeah, but right, but then in the middle Cretaceous and on, yeah. you don't see that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right, that's delamination. Oh, oh, yeah, it's not delamination until it goes away, right? It Good point. Away. It, right, it sure can go away, but it doesn't have to go away. But and in the end, it goes, goes away. In the murals, it doesn't. We, we, we think there, there's, there's reason to believe that this has happened here. And the main reason be that the average velocity structure of the Brazilian shield that is coming in is showing a mafic uh, root of the uh, deep crust. And we don't see that below the Andes anymore. In fact, the average seismic velocities below the Andes um, uh, show rather standard velocities, nothing in terms of very mafic. Right, George? Right. So, so either that has gone by delamination right. or it never was there in the first place. This yeah, assumption. Issue. Exactly, exactly. So all we can state now, it balances, one, and second is we don't see a mafic root, although the incoming Brazilian shield might have provided some. Uh, so either it never was there or it was lost. And but then if it, it was... To, if it was lost, then you have to count that there was more shortening. Exactly, exactly. That's true. Or you must have had substantial mag magmatic addition from the base that uh, with the geochemistry that uh, Sue would probably not buy, uh, that is um, providing seismic velocities that we see, which I would, I would have a difficulty. So, so for people who have, maybe don't have any idea what we're talking about, if you take a, a mafic thing, which is like flagellates and purifying and what those things are, and you increase their pressure to a depth of like 30 or 35 kilometers, the flagellates turns into garnet, which is really dense and has a high elastic modulus. So a thing that was crust turns into something that looks like mantle to a seismologist. So that's True. Yeah. kilometers or so. It was seven point something uh, VP velocities. Mm -hmm. So it theoretically could produce some, some, some uh, eclogite facious uh, material. And in fact, numerical experiments that I have not brought um, or will, will not be showing from Stefan Zobolev nicely shows that um, this material has no chance of staying at the base of the crust um, at 70 kilometers thickening, it will get lost by delamination. Unless there's a flat slab on it. Yeah, something has to carry it. I have a picture of that. Yeah, okay. So. The end has got some duct. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we better. So you talk about the, how the amount of shortening and the, the uh, subduction erosion flux, how is this estimated? Yeah. The, Subduction erosion estimate is based on, on several kinds of data. The key data that are going into this curve are from the motion of the volcanic front. So the volcanic front uh, around the Pacific typically sits around uh, at a position where the, uh, where the top of the downgoing slab is about 100 kilometers deep. And um, uh, the volcanic front here in the central Andes, for example, has moved since the Jurassic by about 200 kilometers. Uh, in fact, the Jurassic volcanic front has been dredged nearly at the trench. So the entire Jurassic 4 arc is gone. And uh, throughout the Cenozoic, the volcanic front has been moving back. In southern Chile, I think we're going to be seeing uh, the story is more complex. and has been hopping about a little bit. 
So, so that's the standard marker you're using, the position of the volcanic front. But this assumes that the subduction angle is... Correct, correct. In fact, for the Andes, um, I'll be showing a view graph in a few minutes that shows that the subduction angle, irrespective of whether we have flat slabs or not, in the upper 100 kilometers is a fairly constant feature. Yes. The eroded the material. The volume, how do you build the end with? From the east or from the west? Let's go to this, uh, this one here, this fundamental view graph. Here you see the material coming in from the east being accreted <coughs> to the Andean Pro Wedge on the right side. Here, on this side, the downgoing Nazca plate is scraping off material from the base of the upper plate and taking it down. not adding it, or we think that if so, only very little can be added because we don't see a disbalance, an imbalance. So presumably most of the material that gets moved uh, uh, off from the base of the upper plate is lost. And geochemists tell us that it's extremely difficult to identify whether it's mixed into the mantle because it would only form a very small percentage. Yes. Yeah. Pressing. The board on the east side, on the west side, is right against, um, or the forces are applied right against yeah. the, the range. But on the, east, on the east side, they have to be far away, right? They have to be coming, you know, the, the point where the force is applied. Where is, the, is the South Atlantic Ridge? It is. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that, that would be probably where you would set the system, the boundary uh, of the system. Uh, it's the, South Atlantic Ridge pushing South America westwards. So do you have any estimate of how much mass is being fluxed in as melt and... Uh, Sue. <laughs> You'll have to wait. We're, we're merging on talking about the same thing here, but I'm going to talk about yeah. a different perspective, totally different perspective. Yeah. Okay. So... This is the masses and the present day state, and now I'm going to add time to that. And uh, how am I going to do that? Um, it's a technique I call origin geospeedometry. Uh, it's very trivial. It's just looking at the deformation magnitudes and the time windows over which this deformation is accumulated. So the wonderful thing about these central Andes being that there's so little eroded material that is leaving the system. It's all staying in the system. The wonderful consequence is that if you can identify that material in the field, like here, where you have syntectonic deposits onlapping on pre-tectonic uh, rocks deformed, and you can see them in the reflection seismic images perfectly and do some um, um, seismic stratigraphy, um, you can do a high-resolution study of the deformation accumulation in the system because the sediments are perfect archives to do that, much better than any other kind of archive that you would want to have. In particular, since these rocks in the Andes, the Andes being a convergent margin with a lot of active magmatism, you have wonderful volca volcanic layers intercalated in these deposits and you can really date uh, the entire sequence and uh, nail down the time windows that are uh, um, included in this deformation. So, for example, this, um, this example here shows uh, uh, this nice fold with a blind fold below, and the next one here, two different uh, folds, uh, and they are deformed hanging walls. We can quantify the deformation in each of these structures, and we can quantify or measure the time window during which this deformation was accumulated. So this is shown here, for example, for this, what we call the Inies fault and its uh, um, um, fault propagation fold in the hanging wall. We can uh, see how much deformation was accumulated and from this seismic uh, stratigraphy, doing some uh, age dating of the volcanics, we can show that it was accumulated during two time windows. One here uh, during the middle Miocene or late Miocene and one during the Oligocene. 
So <coughs> this is a very simple approach. Just measure the deformation in the structure and the amount of shortening and uh, try to find out the age span. And we can now do this for the entire central Andes. And we did this, uh, it took us a few years, and we were able to identify the age frames for nearly all of these coupled fault systems. And they're shown down here. You will not be able to read them. I don't want you to read them. I just want to convince you that we have the data uh, uh, collected. And all you can see from the back is that, is that these curves here look very different um, from one place to the next. Um, they just tell you that these various coupled fault systems here that have been mapped uh, um, and uh, shown here, uh, are shown here in these sections are operating in different periods of time during uh, orogenic evolution. And uh, all I'm going to be dealing with in the, in the next uh, few minutes is looking at the total, at the sum. So what I'm doing is I'm just stacking these data down here. And this is the result showing always time here on, the, um, on this axis here from 50 million years ago to the present. And here is the shortening velocity. OK, shortening velocity versus time. Now, this is our geospeedometer for the central Andes. We can really see how shortening evolved over time. And we note that, uh, for example, we have a, a start somewhere in the Eocene around 45 plus minus an, a few million years ago. And then shortening gradually accelerates. Then it hops up around 30 million years ago to a velocity of uh, around 8 millimeters per year. It uh, stays on this level for most of the Oligocene and Miocene. And in the late Miocene, shortening velocities pop up again to the present day values. And the GPS velocities are shown here on the right side. Ideally, the geological shortening rates should converge with the GPS uh, velocities towards the present. So in a way, you could say we have a three-stage uh, evolution, an early acceleration stage, this plateau for um, most of the middle uh, tertiary, and then it pops up to the present day values uh, in the late Miocene. So that's the. What? I'm just noticing that big shot at five million years. At five million years, yeah, that's true. It seems to be fairly robust. I also include the uncertainty here, although I don't want to go uh, too much in, in, in detail here. But that's the, the level of uncertainty we have from age dating, from um, imprecise data when it comes to shortening uh, and so forth. So, so if you look at very short time windows, your uncertainty may be as large as 50% or more. But as you integrate longer time windows, the relative uncertainty becomes smaller. Overall, if you integrate this curve, you have two uh, ways of looking um, whether it's a whether it's, uh, stable result. The integral should be equivalent to total shortening. And the present day velocities uh, shown in GPS data should be more or less uh, in the same order of magnitudes as the geological shortening rates calculated from the technique that I use here. So this is for the uh, central Andes at 21 degrees, where we have high resolution data for nearly all of these coupled thrust systems. But we can carry that a step further now and do the same kind of exercise for the entire Andes. Um, so this is uh, the curve that I've just shown you for 21 degrees south, which is here at this range. This is uh, earlier data by Terry Jordan and co-workers that was published uh, uh, a while ago from this latitude here. And for all the rest, um, I've compiled this now from literature. And at first sight, it looks very confusing. But there's a pattern. There's a pattern. For example, you will note that all the sections that are crossing the central plateau, they all share substantial similarities. They all show this stage of acceleration, plateau style, popping up of velocities at around 15 ma ago to the present day velocities, all of them. You go all the way south, for example, here on the, these three sections here, they show much lower rates. And in fact, they all show velocity of shortening dying. The same occurs here all the way to the north. Uh, shortening velocities are very low at present, a millimeter per year. <coughs> 
So this really looks like the northern and southern flank of the Andes are dead. They're extinct origins. They're not growing anymore. Yeah, but also look here, you can see the GPS velocities. They also tell you the GPS velocities as the geological velocities. The system is not actively deforming anymore. It's just happily eroding away. And active volcanoes are growing at the top. And there's a transitional zone that is here or there and there. So there's a transition between this rapidly and still actively expanding system of the central Andes and the southern and northern flanks where nothing much is happening anymore. OK, that's the number one message uh, from uh, this data. We can see the time. But it is important that the subduction is occurring at the same rate. Exactly. 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 It must have to do with the bend. Maybe. We'll come to that. <laughs> but this is a first order observable that any kind of model must be able to explain, uh, in particular in view of the fact that, as um, we've just heard, we have subduction of the Nazca plate at more or less the same velocity all along the same system. I'll come to that. <laughs> OK. We, we come to that. Now look at this movie here. It's an animation showing the distribution of shortening over 50 million years. It looks very complex. In fact, it's, it's very South American style. It's like tango. It goes back and forth. Uh, and there's no systematic pattern with the exception of the end where all the deformation accumulates at the margin of the system. Let's look at it again. OK, 40 million years ago, see deformation moving about. There's no real systematic pattern until the very end. Now you see deformation in the plateau dying and all active deformation moving towards the margin of the system. Yeah. Is that made from the king of all the Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Wherever you see these cross-cut relationships with onlapping sediments, you can constrain the ages of the faults. So how do you guarantee <coughs> that you found all the samples all the faults? Good question. In fact, in fact, as you go back in time, you're bound to overlook deformation because it may be covered by younger deposits and you won't be seeing that. Exactly. So, so the consequence, if you, if you think that through, is that during the early stages of deformation, you are probably overseeing more deformation than towards the late stages of deformation accumulation. So eventually the consequence is that you know, towards the early stages of, de of deformation, there may be more white spots that should appear on this map but are not being seen because the geological record is incomplete. However, when you look at that from a semi-quantitative aspect, you start noting first order aspects that are independent of this problem. For example, what you see here are again the three shortening velocity curves for the central portion of the plateau that I've showed you before. And I uh, just recall the aspect that we have this fundamental um, three-stage evolution, increase of velocities, plateau here, and then uh, rapid jump to the present day rates um, at about 15 million years ago. That seems to be a fairly robust result from all these um, shortening velocity curves. Now, what we also see in the view graph down here is the aerial fraction of the system that is undergoing deformation at any one time increment. So around 50 million years ago, nothing was happening here. Then, then the area fraction or the uh, fraction of the system undergoing deformation is rapidly increasing in several stages until, let's say, uh, around 40 to 50 percent 10 to 20 million years ago. 
and then it declines again to the present day value, nicely being shown by the belt of active deformation that is now residing out here, a little deformation on the eastern flank, and that's it. Yeah. But I think what he was saying is like in the early stages, you might still be missing, exactly. missing deformation, and therefore this, the, this curve is rather kind of a minimum estimate. Than exactly. Now, uh, that, I was coming to that. In fact, if you add up the material that may have been there from overlooked deformation, these steps, these initial steps would be steeper. That's the consequence. It's exactly as you say, it's a minimum estimate. It may be more. However, we can also try to make a maximum estimate from this volume balancing issue that we talked about before. If there's too much deformation overseen, we would have a volume balance problem, which we don't have. So the, the deformation overlooked cannot be very large, but we have only a minimum estimate because there's deformation overlooked, but not too much. Now, even with this overlooking problem, we see some interesting aspects here. Oops. Um, you will note that as deformation velocities accelerate, the area undergoing, the area fraction undergoing deformation expands. So you accelerate orogeny, and there's more area involved. This is true for these two early stages here. You can see deformation velocities accelerate, area fraction enlarges. More faults, exactly. More faults over time are accumulating the increasing deformation rates. Exactly. Yeah. Now, for this later stage, it's the other way around. You see this terminal stage of rapid acceleration, but the area fraction is decreasing. As uh, you just saw, now it's, uh, um, we are back to 45 million years. But as you just saw here, active deformation being entirely focused on the eastern rim of the origin. So basically what we're seeing here is a complete delocalization and localization cycle of orogeny. Early stage of orogeny, deformation is spread over the, nearly the entire system. And as the origin matures, deformation is progressively localized at the flank of the system. And this seems to be an ongoing process. You see area fraction is decreasing to this day. So becoming more and more focused on the eastern flank. And plateau, the plateau is virtually being abandoned. We can also look at that in terms of not time, but in terms of total strain accumulated. And you see that all curves through all latitudes, they show a similar general trend. First, deforming area increases to the range of about uh, 10 to 20 percent total strain. And then it decreases to the present day value that seems to be something, it, it looks like it's uh, running into a more stable uh, uh, kind of plateau uh, out here with just about 20 percent of the entire plateau area undergoing deformation. So this is a very interesting kind of observation that we have not been able to do so far in other orogenic belts for the simple fact that we lack resolution in time because we lack the kind of data that we need to really define which faults were active at which stage of the orogenic evolution. If we can do that for, an ex for a case like in the Andes, we note that we um, apparently have a fundamental pattern that shows that the origin expands not only in space but also in terms of fraction of the system undergoing deformation and that as the system matures deformation gets more and more localized in the flanks. And the plateau itself dies in terms of being an actively deforming system. Is this, is this largely because you just can't make it any higher? That may be an explanation. Yeah, it may have reached uh, some kind of threshold elevation where it simply would resist growing further in elevation and would prefer to expand laterally. Yeah. This could be a direct um, uh, consequence. But 
in the central and uh, in the Altiplano plateau, we have no focal plane mechanisms at all because there's no seismicity. Exactly. Exactly. And as you've seen here in this view graph, oh, let me go. So let's go here again, and uh, I'll show this movie a last time. 40 million years, you see the entire system undergoing deformation. This here is the Altiplano. Down here is the Puna Plateau. And you'll note exactly this kind of uh, aspect that Sue was alluding to. Uh, as the system evolves, um, it does so in a similar manner. But here, the Altiplano is shut off, and the Puna still has ongoing deformation. So the Puna is well and alive. Uh, happily firing away earthquakes, um, the Altiplano here doesn't. No, it's higher. The Puna is about four and a half kilometers and the Altiplano is 3.8 kilometers. So, so absolute elevation is not sufficient to explain this observation. Can you show us on a map where it's expected though? Hmm? Let me, oh, it's probably better to take a quick, okay. Okay, here this flat topped area, that's the Altiplano Plateau. Here the southern part of the plateau that looks more rugged is the Puna. The more rugged one is the one still actively deforming. The flat topped one is just sitting there and uh, uh, um, collecting the detritus from the surrounding uh, mountain chains and not deforming in anymore itself. No shortening at all is here in this area here where you don't see any very relevant topography either, right? You can see there's a fundamental change in topographic aspect. If you move from here to the area around Santiago, which already is very high and actively deforming, it's directly seen in the topography where you are actively acquiring deformation and where the system is dead. Uh, yes. Uh, um, uh, not on the eastern flank, on the western flank, there's a difference in precipitation. I'll come to that. Uh, so we were, where were we? We were here. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, pattern we get uh, for the present with this localization, again shown in uh, small out here. In the middle, you see the active, the number of active faults moving and their average slip velocity, which is about 0.25 millimeters per year. And you note as well, again, that at around 12 to 15 MA ago, the number of active faults accumulating deformation decreases dramatically by practically an order of magnitude. And the average slip velocity on these faults also increases by an order of magnitude to about three to four millimeters per year. So something dramatic is happening to this entire system at around 15 million years ago. Something really dramatic changing the entire kinematic evolution. It accelerates and it localizes during this time frame. And you can also calculate the bulk strain rate or fault strain rate, and you will note that strain rates increase by roughly an order of magnitude during this time frame. So some very fundamental change is affecting the Andes, the central Andes, I should say. Uh, the northern and southern Andes are dying, and the central Andes are really going into uh, high velocity, in high velocity mode and localizing strains substantially more efficiently at the eastern flank um, of the system. This is most probably reflecting weakening, lithosphere scale weakening of the system. You could also, however, think about external forcing changing to some degree. 
But most presumably, that's my preferred one, is we are uh, looking at lithosphere scale weakening of the system, driving this acceleration and driving the localization at once. OK. So the number one candidate for this weakening issue, obviously, is the first order low angle detachment fault system that I've shown here on this system here, underlying this entire thrust belt and collecting all the active faults at the surf that are emergent at the surface. And this thrust belt system, or this fundamental detachment, is continuous, where it is shown here as a continuous line. And it's not continuous out here. And it's not present here and in the north at all. So the emergence of this fundamental detachment system is probably instrumental in driving this evolution that we have just seen, in accelerating the system and in localizing deformation. And it can only really do so if it's a very weak system. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to do that. This fault must be so weak that it forces all the other faults to shut down, and hence uh, accumulating all the remaining deformation responsible for the acceleration that we see out here. So this is the number one observable. You need, apparently, a certain minimum amount of strain before you can produce such a through-going lithosphere scale weak fault system. And the strain magnitudes that we've been talking about is around 20% or so, 20% or a little more. This strain threshold has not been reached here in the south nor in the north. OK, so here are the kinematic results. Uh, Central Andes are only active today. The rest in the north and south is uh, largely dead. And uh, the mass distribution is towards the central parts of the system with parts of uh, the mantle lithosphere lost and substantial crustal thickening uh, by material influx here from the east. We have a stepwise increase in shortening velocity, and we can associate that with a complete cycle of first delocalizing, shortening, and then localizing deformation in the system with a fundamental break at around 15 to 12 million years ago. And so uh, we note that um, the analysis of these shortening rates of shortening velocities over time may be a powerful tool really to get hold of uh, what the evolution of a particular orogenic system is. Unfortunately, this is probably only doable in very few orogenic systems on this planet because we lack the geological archives to do so. OK, time is advanced, but I was um, asked a few questions. So how much more time do you give me, Alan? Well, we're 15 minutes into the coffee break, so a few more. OK, no, no at this point, I would probably uh, uh, just some the debate um, that is imminent within the entire earth science community. Um, there's a zoo of candidates that has been suggested to drive the Andes. And you can see most of the standard uh, candidates uh, listed on this view graph. Obviously, convergence, rates, uh, convergence rate is a first order candidate, one of the most popular over um, the decades. Uh, more recently, the absolute drift of the upper plate with respect to the hotspot reference frame has been suggested as a candidate. I have to confess, I was particularly fond of that one uh, for a while. Um, um, other people have argued that thermal weakening of the base of the upper plate may play a first order role, uh, weakening the system to the point where it will accumulate more deformation. This may or may not be related to changes in slab dip so slab geometry has been identified as a first order candidate. Um, other people have argued that the strength of the plate interface zone here must be a first order candidate. Uh, if that uh, strength evolves or changes over time, it should be expressed in changing reaction in the system. And more recently, mm, this idea of climate and tectonics uh, has become very popular, where people have argued that if you turn on erosion and you remove masses about by erosion, you may affect the strength of the uh, upper plate system uh, as well. So it's a zoo of candidates. And I'm 
not going to go through them, um, uh, but just show you one as an example. Uh, this is the number one candidate that has been the most popular over the decades until maybe a few years ago. You see here the shortening velocity curve that is not to scale. And what you see here is the convergence velocity between the Nazca plate and South America. Any similarity? Not really. In fact, in some cases, it looks like it's anti-correlated. Look at this deceleration of convergence since the middle Miocene. This is when the Andes are really speeding up. So the classical idea of convergence velocity, it doesn't hold. It doesn't work. And you can do this kind of time series correlation for uh, the entire zoo of candidates that I've shown you. And I'd be happy to show uh, uh, them for those of you that are more interested in. The one message that I would just like to conclude with is that it's extremely hard to find any correlation at all. You find very few. You start wondering eventually that you, uh, what the reason is that you find so few correlations. Reason number one could be the quality of the data is not sufficient. Well, perhaps. I don't think so. I think that um, in multiply coupled systems, where most of the laws governing the systems are nonlinear, it's probably really coincidental if the curves really show a one-to-one -one correlation. Um, yet, I would be careful with the correlation argument from a very different kind of argument. If you correlate time series, which is a very popular strategy, for example, in climate research or whatnot, uh, people often tend to mistake correlation for cause. Uh, correlation is not the same as cause. You may have a wonderful time signal that correlates, uh, but unless you know the physics underlying it, you should be careful in taking that for cause. It may be purely coincidental like the stork and baby issue. Uh, in fact, it has been shown that the stork and baby issue, it correlates in time. Yeah. <laughs> and there are even suggestions for the physical, uh, physical reason underlying that. Now, <clears throat> whatever we do, um, my gut feeling is that uh, the current stage, um, we don't really understand how these various mechanisms that I've shown you in this video graph interact to produce, as a result, this deformation signal. We don't understand that very well. The one reason, the one factor that is very often forgotten here, and it's not listed here, is the change of properties internally from accumulating deformation. I've shown you that in this view graph, that you need to accumulate a certain amount of deformation before you can really start localizing deformation in the upper plate and weakening it to the point where it accelerates. This is usually forgotten, completely forgotten. You change material properties as you deform materials. And I think Greg is going to talk a lot more about this kind of issue. It's a fascinating uh, uh, aspect that we know very well from rock mechanics, but we don't usually apply it when we look at the lithosphere scale. Yet the system probably behaves exactly the same. OK, so with this kind of statement, I'd like to finish. And anybody who wants to know more, I have lots of more view graphs that show the details of these various correlations, where they correlate and where they don't. Thanks for the attention.